Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Welcome back, friends, to Hayek Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a lifestyle, and Jesus Christ is truly King of kings and Lord of lords. Well, I am encouraged by the fact that you are back for a second helping in this series of studies that is going to be somewhat like a spiritual surgery. And obviously, as with any surgery, this is going to create some pain, some agony, uh, but the end result is going to be beautiful and is going to bring you much joy and satisfaction in the work that you allow the Word of God to perform within you. Now friends, in order for us to experience revival, the first thing that we have to experience is brokenness. There are several people that you could talk to about brokenness if you wanted to truly understand what it was about. You might talk to David after his sin with Bathsheba. You might talk to Moses after his disobedience, or you could certainly talk to Peter after his three denials. You see, each of these were broken in their own way, but that act of brokenness was the only way that they could be used by the Most High. Now, friends, realistically, brokenness isn't something that can be explained to you. It's something that you must experience. And if you cooperate with what you're going to hear In this series, by the end, friends, you truly will know deeply what brokenness is all about. We want to be very simple in this matter of revival. Revival in simplicity is simply the life of the Lord Jesus poured into human hearts. And Jesus is always victorious. I mean, in heaven right now, they're praising him all the time for his victory on Calvary. If you steal everything, quiet everything, and listen very closely, you can hear the angels, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is, hallelujah, and is to come. I'm sure you've had those mornings where you wake up and it seems like the heavens are brass, Everything is dry and barren in your spiritual life. Jesus doesn't experience that. He is life. He is joy. He is goodness and kindness and mercy and compassion. He knows nothing else. And as we wake and we place ourselves in him, we fight to get out of that stale mood. And we place ourselves in him. That union That joint relationship allows us to celebrate and to live every moment of our lives in that life, in that joy, in that goodness, kindness, and compassion. But it is a fight. What you will find, however, friend, is the more constant you remain in this fight, the stronger you become. The more you keep yourself in Christ, the more immovable you become. His power is boundless. His love is limitless. And his victory is endless. All we must do is get into a right relationship with him. Then we shall see his power being demonstrated in our hearts, in our lives, in our service. And then, friends, as it is with him, victorious life will fill us. It will overflow through us to others. And that is revival. If, however, we are to come into this right relationship with him, the first thing that we must learn is that our wills must be broken to his will. To be broken is the beginning of revival. It is painful. It is humiliating. But it is the only way. It is being, as quoted by Paul in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, not I, but Christ. And if you think about it, a sea 
is simply a bent eye. The Lord Jesus cannot live in us fully and reveal himself through us until the proud self within us is broken. The degree that pride exists within you, friend, is deeper than your mind can comprehend. Do you remember the Titanic and the great iceberg that brought her down? But beneath the waters lay the true beast. Because what you could see above the water wasn't close in comparison to what lied beneath. So it is with pride, friends. You'll see pride on the surface. You can see it in your life. But the beast is buried deep within in places that you haven't even revealed yet. And it must be broken. This simply means that the hard, unyielding self, which justifies itself, which wants its own way, which stands up for its own rights and seeks its own glory, it will at last bow its head to God's will. It will admit its wrongs. It will give up its own ways to Jesus. It will surrender its rights and discard its own glory. Why? So that the Lord Jesus might have all and be all. In other words, it is dying to self and self-attitudes. As we look honestly at our Christian lives, we can see how much of this self there is in each of us. It is so often self who tries to live the Christian life. I mean, the mere fact that we use the word try indicates that it is a self who has the responsibility. It is self, too, who is often doing Christian work. It is always self who gets irritable and envious and resentful and critical and worried. It is self who is hard and unyielding in its attitude to others. It is self who is shy and self-conscious and reserved. No wonder we need breaking. As long as self is in control, God can do little with us. For all the fruits of the Spirit, and you will find those in Galatians chapter 5, all the fruits of the Spirit with which God longs to fill us are the complete antithesis of the hard, unbroken Spirit within us and presupposes that it has been crucified. Being broken, my friends, is both God's work and your work. He brings his pressure to bear, but you have to make the choice. If you are really open to conviction as you seek fellowship with God, God will show us the expressions of this proud, hard self that cause him pain. Then it is, at that point, we can stiffen our necks and refuse to repent or we can bow the head and say, yes, Lord. Brokenness in daily experience is simply the response of humility to the conviction of God. Let me say that again. Brokenness in daily experience is simply the response of humility to the conviction of God. And inasmuch as this conviction is continuous, we shall need to be broken continually. Ah, see, you thought it was a one-time event. No, friends, it's many times throughout the day. And this can be very costly when we see all the yielding of rights and selfish interests that this will involve and the confessions and restitutions that may become necessary. For this reason, we're not likely to be broken except at the cross of Jesus. The willingness of Jesus to be broken for us is the all-compelling motive in our being broken too. We see him who is in the form of God, counting not equality with God, a prize to be grasped at and hung on to, but letting it go for us and taking upon him the form of a servant, God's servant, man's servant. We see him willing to have no rights of his own, no home of his own, no possessions of his own. 
willing to let men revile him and not revile again, willing to let men tread on him and not retaliate or defend himself. Above all, we see him broken as he meekly goes to Calvary to become man's scapegoat by bearing their sins in his own body on the tree. In a pathetic passage in a prophetic psalm, he says, I am a worm and no man. That's found in Psalms 22. Those who have been in tropical lands tell us there's a big difference between a snake and a worm when you attempt to strike at them. The snake rears itself up and hisses and tries to strike back. A true picture of self. But a worm offers no resistance. It allows you to do what you like with it. Kick it. Squash it under your heel. It truly is a picture of true brokenness. And Jesus was willing to become just that for us. A worm and no man. And he did so because that is what he saw us to be. Worms having forfeited all of our rights by our sin except to deserve hell. And he now calls us to take our rightful place as worms for him and with him. The whole Sermon on the Mount with its teachings of non-retaliation, love for enemies, selfless giving, assumes that this is our position. But only the vision of the love that was willing to be broken for us can constrain us to be willing for that. So as mentioned before, dying to self is not a thing we do once and for all. It is a daily event. There may be an initial dying when God first shows these things, but ever after it will be a constant dying, for only so can the Lord Jesus be revealed constantly through us. All day long the choice will be before us in a thousand ways. It will mean no plans, no time, no money, no pleasure of our own. It will mean a constant yielding to those around us, for our yieldedness to God is measured by our yieldedness to man. Every humiliation, everyone who tries and vexes us, is God's way of breaking us, so that there is a yet deeper channel in us for the life of Christ. You see, the only life that pleases God and that can be victorious is His life. It's never our life, no matter how hard we try. But inasmuch as our self-centered life is the exact opposite of His, we can never be filled with his life unless we are prepared for God to bring our life constantly to death. And in that, my friends, we must cooperate by our moral choice. So as we close, friends, let me repeat that one more time. Every day is a new opportunity for us to deny ourselves and crucify our flesh. And each of those days We'll present those choices in over a thousand ways. And for us, this will mean no plans, no time, no money, no pleasure of our own. It will mean a constant yielding to those around us, for our yieldedness to God is measured by our yieldedness to man. I trust, friends, that you can sense the spirit of the Most High stirring deep within your soul, causing you to long for such brokenness, causing you to long and thirst for a life lived like Messiah. And I'll leave you with this, friends. That hunger can only be satisfied as you bow ever so low before your King, Lay yourself prostrate before him. Invite such humiliation and suffering into your life. And live holy for the benefit and the sake of others. Now I pray that the Almighty will do a work in us that only he can do. Both me, you, and everyone listening. That only he can do in transforming us into the very image of his son. Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. Now as Yahweh wills, and until next time my friends, I'll see you on the next video.